everyone, and welcome to Collider Movie Talk, movie talk for movie fans. I'm your host, Natasha Martinez, and this is the daily show where we share with you all the latest movie news and some insight into what it all means. Joining us on this very special day is, of course, John Campion. It is a special day. It is the most holy and special <laughs> of silent nights today, because today is Star Wars Day, ladies and gentlemen. Glad you could join us. And we got John Schnepp. What's going on, everybody? I didn't see Star... What, what is it called again? Star Wars or Star Trek? It's one of those we're going to talk about today. And Mark Ellis. I've had all the energy drinks. I've had all the health food this morning. I had a delicious shake. I am determined to stay alive for the next eight hours. At least. I mean, if you can just make it past the next eight Knowing hours. Knowing my health at most, eight hours. <laughs> all right, folks. Listen, as happens sometimes, before we started the show and after we had all these delightful show notes all written... Another piece of movie news dropped in the world of film. We're going to talk about a lot of other stuff today, but we're going to start off with this. The first official trailer for the new Star Trek movie, Trek, Trek, not Wars. The first official trailer for the new Star Trek movie dropped just about an hour ago online. Star Trek Beyond, the first trailer came. Uh, I have been really looking forward to it. I'm one of these guys that I have been a fan of the J.J. Abrams incarnation of the Star Trek thing. I didn't like uh, Into Darkness as much as the first one, but I still had a lot of fun with Into Darkness. I thought it was a really fun film. Anyway, Schnepp, you saw the new Star Trek Beyond trailer this morning. What did you think about it? Star Trek Beyond. So let me just start this by saying I like the new Star Trek, the weird pocket universe or whatever. Uh, I'm a Star Trek fan. I'm a Star Wars fan. I like science fiction. Love science fiction, actually. And so I like the, the new Star Trek. And I know a lot of Trekkies had issues with it and whatnot. And I actually liked Star Trek Into Darkness. It didn't bother me. There were problems. The We could bring up the Tribbles. We could bring up a lot of issues. <laughs> it didn't really make that much sense. The mystery box con thing bugged me. But overall, <laughs> I enjoyed it. I didn't actually, I got a, a kick out of Spock yelling, con! I, I know there was like, that's supposed to be Kirk. Well, whatever. This is a pocket universe. Deal with it. That With that, let me just say, I absolutely hated this Star Trek Beyond trailer. Using the Beastie Boys as music as a backbone for your Star Trek trailer, it sounds good like a dumb executive was like, hey, JJ had that in the first movie. What about <laughs> Beastie Boys? Kids like Beastie Boys. What about putting that in? <laughs> Horrible idea. Ru it ruined the trailer for me. Just and I love that is your fourth grade movie executive. I, no, that's <laughs> like that's a guy. I just had way too much coffee. I was like. <laughs> I hated that music, and I love the Beastie Boys. I absolutely love the Beastie Boys, but that combined with Star Trek and just showing people do karate punches and kicks, Star Trek is supposed to be about the brain. It's about science and about learning and knowledge and fun and action and adventure. But it's like it's it's like it's like a a western in space, and this felt like I'm watching a kung fu kids cartoon sh show filled with sugar smacks. I didn't like it. So I like the aliens. I'm sure when they actually put out a second trailer that doesn't have, it's not cut like a music video, I, I won't hate it, but I hated it. I did not hate it, but I didn't get the reaction out of it that I wanted to have watching. First, first up, you're absolutely right. It's an awesome Beastie Boys tune. Yeah, Sabotage. <laughs> not amazing. the right place for that tune. That this this is not now. Look, I know, but well, John and some of the previous. Okay, I don't care. We're just we're talking about the trailer. It was a bad move for the trailer. That is not the music you should have for a Star Trek trailer. Period. End of sentence. Now, maybe if I see the movie and actually that song is in the movie and predominant in the movie, mm -hmm. maybe I'll, in hindsight I'll go, oh, okay, well maybe it makes sense that they use it. But I haven't seen the movie yet, so you're showing this trailer. People haven't seen the movie yet, so the song does not make sense. Just period. I was intrigued by the notion that it looks like this is going to be our first of the new breed of Star Trek films that happens planet side mm -hmm. as opposed to being a big space adventure. Right. At first, I was really turned off by if you're going to destroy the Enterprise, you don't show it to us in the trailer. But if it's something that happens in the first five or ten minutes of right. the movie, okay, I'll, I'll let that go. I really did love that one scene because it felt very classic Star Trek to me about, well, at least I don't have to die alone. And Spock disappears. <laughs> well, that's sure. that was classic Bones and Spock. So that felt really good. But I... I like Star I said, Trek, I explosions. That's what I think of what it is. Star yeah, Trek, explosions I, and karate kicks. I So I didn't hate it. I didn't hate it, but... 
I, I'm feeling conflicted about it at the same time, and I don't want to feel conflicted about it. I want to see the new Star Trek trailer and be totally amazed by it and have a lot of fun with it, and that wasn't my experience. Anyway, Mark, you saw it. What did you think There's about definitely it? a conflict inside of me as well. Shep, you're right on with the Honey Smacks thing. I almost got diabetes watching this trailer. <laughs> it's so sugary sweet. They should have called it Star Trek Spring Break because that's what the movie is. <laughs> it's all, it just seems like there's a bunch of people high-fiving. Man, yeah. this is great. We're all on an adventure together. Oh, man, I crashed my dad's car. Oh, well, we'll get a new one. But having said that, I am not a huge Star Trek fan prior to the J.J. Abrams reboots because I just did not explore it that much. As a kid, I never watched Next Generation. I had seen a few of the movies here and there. I know they saved some whales in part four, but I'm just not that into the lore like John Schnepp is. So watching this trailer, I didn't hate it. I thought it was pretty cool. It made me laugh. I liked the humor in this trailer. The use of the BC Boys song definitely took me out of it. Then I had to go back into it. And I love Sabotage. It's a great video. It didn't feel like it belonged here. But all the humor that they put in the trailer, I'm like, I want to see this movie. Is it a Star Trek movie? Will it fit in that universe? I have no idea, but I liked the movie that this trailer seems to be selling. Do you get that? I yeah. see you're saying, yeah. And I'm look, this trailer, <clears throat> like I said, I it didn't do for I'm looking forward to the next trailer. Yeah. There are a number of films that I've really liked where I hated the first trailer. I'm gonna keep my fingers crossed. And once again, I'm very interested by the notion of having this be their first of the new breed Star Trek movies happening planet side. They're without their ship. Now this, we're gonna focus on the crew. We heard Idris Elba's voice, but I don't know if that one alien they showed us was supposed to be Idris Elba in the right. makeup, or if that's a little bit of a misdirection. I watched that thing that, five times, that, just boom, boom, no, that's, boom, and that's, I could not tell. That's Idris Elba in the makeup. Yeah. Think so? yeah, that's, I it's guarantee I think it. so as well, I I'm not it. sure. Do you think part of this, though, is that they want this controversy? Is that they want fans to be going back and forth as to whether they like it? Because now Star Trek gets noticed in a week when Star Wars is going to be getting so much attention. that I, like, like I went on Twitter oh. this morning, and a lot of people were excited about Star Wars, obviously, but there was a lot of talk, good and bad, about the new Star Trek trailer. I thought that was interesting. You know what just hit me I just it just hit me they're trying to do Guardians of the Galaxy because at, right at the very beginning Kirk is listening to the Beastie Boys remember he listened to it when he was a kid mm -hmm. and he's playing that tape because Scotty's like what's that's music he's like it's a really good song and he's listening to the Beastie Boys sabotage and they're doing that mixtape like because I remember reading that oh we want Star Trek to be like more Guardians of the Galaxy and then it just like they're knocking that off they're trying to like take a little mixtape flavor and play that through the entire trailer how lame Although we might watch the movie and that scene may come and it's a totally different I'm, piece of music I, they're I, listening to. I'm not saying I won't love the movie because I really like the first two Star Trek movies. I'm talking to specifically about this trailer. It pissed yeah. me off. Uh, yeah. Yep. All right. Well, now let's get on to our first official Good. piece of news for the day. Natasha, what do we got? It's Monday, which means it's time for our weekend box office report brought to you by our friends at AMC Theaters. Coming in at number one for a fourth week in a row is The Hunger Games Mockingjay Part 2, which took the top spot by under $300,000. The final installment for The Hunger Games franchise has now taken over $564 million worldwide. Coming in second place is the new Ron Howard film in the Heart of the Sea, taking in just over $11 million on its opening weekend. In third is the Pixar film The Good Dinosaur, making an additional $10.5 million in its third week of release. Coming in fourth is Creed, making $10.12 million, also in its third week of release. And rounding out the top five is the Christmas horror film Krampus, making $8 million. Mark... What stands out to you about this week's box office report? Uh, well, Americans hate whales, apparently. <laughs> Not even Star Trek Four could save this whale. That is a disappointing <laughs> haul. I thought In the Heart of the Sea would at least be number one. I didn't think it'd make a boatload of money, but you at least think no pun intended. You at least thought that it would beat a movie that's what on its third week of release, even though it's Hunger Games. So Hunger Games continues to be an impressive movie. It has a, it has nice legs. After that slightly, slightly, possibly kind of disappointing opening weekend, it's still is number one. I like that Krampus hung on there and the good dinosaur and Creed exactly where I thought they would be. I just, I'm shocked that in the heart of the sea with all the advertising that I've seen for this movie, there's been a lot of buzz about it. They were positioning it for Oscar season. Doesn't look like it's going to make a dent in that. I thought more people would care about seeing that because it, even if you don't think Chris Hemsworth is a star or you didn't want to see that tale, just seeing the effects and seeing that it's a movie on the ocean with this giant beast attacking people, I thought it'd get more than 11 million. Yeah, um... I remember being so excited for this movie a year ago. Yeah, right. When it was supposed to come out. March. Or, yeah, it was supposed March. to come out in March. Yeah. It was supposed to come out in March. They had started the ad campaign for it and all this push, and then all of a sudden they stopped it and they moved it again. I think that confused a number of people. 
And then the word of mouth started to go out. Right now in the heart of the sea, this movie that we were kind of expecting was going to be a serious Oscar contender, especially when the, you know, it's a Ron Howard film, you know, the thing that Moby Dick is based mm -hmm. on, and the studio pushed it to Oscar consideration season. All hopes that this is going to be an Oscar contending movie. But right now, the movie sits at like 43 or 44% critic rating, only like a 65% audience rating. I enjoyed the movie, but it came in so below my expectations, and I think the word got out about it really, really fast. So the on-again, off-again marketing campaign from the earlier year to the end of the year, the lukewarm reviews, the lukewarm word of mouth all add up. I still thought it would get 20 plus. Mm -hmm. I still thought it would get 20 plus. But everybody's saving up their Star Wars money right now right. for their fourth and fifth viewings. <clears throat> I don't know. What about what about you, Schnapp? What stands out to you about this week's box office? Report? I mean, definitely in the heart of the sea, getting harpooned by uh, Mocking oh, Jack. Oh, oh, that's what I did. Continue. Oh, I can't help it. Um, <laughs> this segment should be the new Star Trek trailer. Ooh. We are crushing <laughs> the puns. Um, you know what stands out to me? I didn't see in the heart of the sea yet, and I do want to see it, and I'm still looking forward to it, even though a lot of critics have you know been lukewarm about it. I feel the thing that sticks out to me is I finally saw Krampus. And I want to call the movie crappy. I, I can't even believe that it was number one at the box office, in, or number two. It was competitive with Hunger right. Games last week. Hunger lot. Games did 18, Krampus did 16 opening weekend, which I thought, and, and look, I felt the same way you did about Krampus. I'm just happy to see that people want to see a horror comedy around the holidays. It's more for the sentiment than the right. actual quality of the movie. I just movie. think they should re-release a good movie like Rare Exports, then everyone can go see yes. that instead of seeing this horribly bad, really, underperforming film. There's no story, it's not funny. Right. I mean, I, I can't wish that you could not go see Krampus. I wish you could take your money back, because <laughs> after I saw it, I was like, how did it make all that money? <laughs> it's a horrible film, it's not it's funny. funny I, I it's funny, it's garbage. It got better reviews than I was expecting it was gonna get. I know, and, and all my friends were like, the practical effects, I was like, I don't care about the practical effects if the story sucks. You know what I mean? It's like there's some cool little creep, and also there's like gingerbread man. Spoiler, there's gingerbread man in it. <laughs> I just was like, it's not about Krampus. It's more like a like a, a really bad 80s half hour show that's stretched out. Yeah, I but, didn't care about any of the characters. I, I'll tell you this, if you put a big advertising budget behind a movie that purports to have an evil Santa Claus, people are gonna wanna see that movie. You're Even right. more so than, oh, there's this giant whale and it's on a boat and just, whales just are not the box office attraction no. that sharks are. Here's, here's evil, evil, Santa, evil Santa is. Yeah. Yeah. End of the yeah. day, not notwithstanding what a home video or whatever, Krampus is going to end up making more at the box office than in the heart of the sea. Right. Wrap your head around that right. for a minute. No, in, How in the heart of the sea is a hundred million dollar movie. Krampus, I think, is like a fifteen million dollar movie, and it's already made at the box office twenty two million. You just got to wonder what could have been because this movie was finished. They could have released it in March. Right. This movie probably would have done a lot more in March yeah. than it does in Plus December. Plus, we're excited to see it. I think yes, the Rotten we Tomatoes reviews would have been better too, because critics, however, we like to say that we're, we're you know we walk into a movie and we're not thinking about anything else. The fact that it's December might taint your experience as opposed to March, where you just want to go see an interesting movie. Mm -hmm. I think people would have liked it better in March too. All right, what's next? A brand new promo for the upcoming Fox film Deadpool aired last night, confirming that a new trailer for the <laughs> film will arrive on Christmas Day. Reports claim that the new trailer will have both a traditional green band version as well as a red band version, and we all know which one we're more interested in. <laughs> this <laughs> new poster for Deadpool also recently arrived online, claiming, wait till you get a load of me. John, what are you looking forward to the new Deadpool spots? First of all, it's a testament to my 12-year-old maturity level <laughs> that the double entendre of this movie poster, I saw this poster and I laughed my freaking head off for about a good solid two minutes. <laughs> uh, this, this is such a brilliant poster that just affirms how smart, how brilliant, how, how much Fox has their fingers on the pulse of how to market this Deadpool movie, mm -hmm. which just makes me lament all the more as how you can be so freaking clueless when it comes to Fantastic Four, but you can nail Deadpool <laughs> so absolutely That's perfectly. Right. Completely nailed. The marketing campaign for Deadpool is going to end up being one of my top 10 favorite movies in 2016. <laughs> Not necessarily the Deadpool movie, mm -hmm. but the marketing campaign. Everything they're doing with this thing is brilliant. From the poster, that TV ad is like, hi, I'm Deadpool, the other guy in the red suit with a lap worth sitting on. I mean, yeah. come on, everything he's been doing in this has been so spot on and fun. I am just completely entertained mm -hmm. by the marketing campaign. I can't remember the last time I felt this way about a marketing campaign for the movie. I look forward to every little thing they put out because everything they put out is 
fun and entertaining and funny. And I just can't. Oh, man. I just hope the movie doesn't suck now. What a punch in the bag that I would know. be if the movie sucks oh. at this point. I and mean, Mark, you had a chance to see all the stuff. What do you think about I think it? when Deadpool comes out and it is successful and it will be, the first person in line after you throw a boatload of money at Ryan Reynolds to come back is the promotions department. Oh, yeah. They all deserve a raise for stuff like this because this isn't the first we've seen of Deadpool. Everything that we have seen has been so funny and just no, the, the comedy is fantastic. It's just exactly what Deadpool fans want to see. They've been clamoring for this for so long and they're just knocking it out of the park and then when you see the promo it's hilarious the promo for the promo is hysterical yep. when you can it's so meta to think the promo for the promo for the promo is great and it is i love everything deadpool's doing right now i can't imagine the movie lives up to it i, think <laughs> I, I know great, i know but nothing's gonna make uh, me laugh more than this or that little bit the, the little thing that we saw today where they're they're advertising the 12 days of christmas right. my question is the official trailer drops on christmas right yep. yes there's got to be something that they're putting before the force awakens because everybody's seen right. that screenshot of right. all these imax trailers that are supposedly going to be there so is it deadpool specifically referencing star wars is it the promo we saw online I'm curious to see what that is i wonder Should if that's just another secret viral campaign i'd love to see him thing. making fun of star, star wars, wars. Oh, yeah, yeah, that would be be amazing Great. yeah i agree uh, before i see deadpool i'm gonna see all of these viral little him at the, with the kids in halloween him when they announce that they're doing an r rating i want to watch all of that as one like little mini movie you know what i mean oh yeah like it could almost be an hour worth of like fun viral <laughs> campaign stuff uh remember i predicted it's gonna make over a hundred million dollars opening weekend i said that like six months ago <laughs> i still don't think it will but man i hope you're right i i know i'll be there i think the the viral campaign the way they're running this is incredible you're right like anybody who's like got a brain who's a producer hire this viral marketing campaign team these are the people who should have put out john carter because they would have yes. put it out or they would have done it right they would have done the live die repeat i don't know what the edge of whatever it was called they would have like at least retitled it or let it be something you would have remembered it would have been a hit because they're doing everything right to sell this character and to get people into the idea that this character breaks the fourth wall he's broken the fourth wall repeatedly so when you finally see the film and he's doing it it's not going to be weird it's actually going to be natural they're building this character that is literally an unknown to everyone who's not a comic book nerd or, or you know cartoon nerd this is a character who's grown up like in the media so it's like he doesn't have a first movie he doesn't have a well we can't really count x-men origins because that was no the we worst not introduction to a character you could possibly imagine <laughs> they sewed his mouth shut so it's it's actually somebody who's coming back from the dead so i think this is a fantastic really fun way to tease a movie i'm more excited to see this movie now than ever now to, to reference the whole breaking the fourth wall right. spot the spot they ran specifically for espn last night the one they ran on sports center had what's the guy from um from Silicon Valley, who plays his best friend in the movie. Uh, TJ Miller. TJ Miller. Yeah. TJ Miller's actually in the spot with them, and Deadpool's going on, and then finally TJ Miller's like, who are you talking to? Which is it, which somebody who's not a Deadpool yeah. fan will not will go over their head a little bit, but people who are Deadpool fans is like the total reference to the fourth yeah. wall. Now here's the real litmus test, Natasha. I mean, now as somebody at this table who is not like a hardcore comic book nerd, mm -hmm. what are you <laughs> thinking of this Deadpool stuff that you've been seeing so far? I mean, it's definitely attention grabbing. I just <laughs> I was scrolling down in my show notes and I saw it and I think my words were, oh, okay. <laughs> so now being introduced into you know all of these movies, I'm like, all right, let's see what's gonna happen next. <laughs> all right, well listen folks, we've reached that part of the show now for buy or sell. Here's how this works. In front of her, Natasha's got a few other items in the world of movie news. She's gonna run them down. Then those of us at the table are simply gonna say whether we buy it or sell. So Natasha, what do we got? Mad Max Fury Road made just over $375 million at the worldwide box office during its theatrical run. And now fans may have another chance to see it on the big screen again. According to a story in Screen Daily, there may be plans over at Warner Bros. to release a black and white cut of Fury Road back into theaters sometime in 2016. There were earlier reports that director George Miller had planned to include a black and white version in the Blu-ray release of the film, but that incarnation never materialized. Schnepp, would you buy or sell a theatrical re-release of Mad Max Fury Road in black and white? I buy it, buy it, buy it. I absolutely love this movie and I love black and white. You know, a lot of people uh, make versions of their, their film in black and white like Frank Darabont did that with The Mist and then he released a special edition version of his film in black and white so that it could harken back to the time of the Twilight Zone series and when things were made in black and white. But one of the greatest things is if you've seen Sin City, the use of black and white 
it's its own medium. It's a transportation device, especially we live in the world of everything is full color. We have the rainbow spectrum. You can use black and white as a tool. And I think that's something that George Miller did fantastically well with the deep yellows and browns and, you know, ochres of, of, of Mad Max. I think in his mind, he was like thinking, oh, wait, I cannot wait to make this a high contrast, black and white, gritty film. So I cannot wait to see what he does. It's different than just taking the film and like tuning it to the black and white yourself. He's going to color correct or uncolor correct every single sequence. So I'm really looking forward to it. I sell this. And the reason <laughs> I sell it is because of this. When you think of Mad Max Fury Road, I mean, it's 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 dystopia, it's post-apocalyptic, it's, it's dirt and it's grime. And yet it was visually one of the most beautiful films of the year. And the use of color. It was so rich and vibrant, despite the fact that it's in a desert wasteland world. It is absolutely one of the most incredibly beautiful. The cinematography in this movie to me is astounding. I love the idea of bringing it back for a short run in 2016 so we can all get a chance to go and watch it on the big screen again, but I wanna watch it the way it was shot. I wanna watch it fully appreciating all that incredible cinematography, their use of color, how rich the film looked. I want to see that. I'm curious about the black and white, but I kind of wish they had done what Miller had originally said right, they were going to do, TV. which is put on the Blu-ray right. as an extra feature. I'd totally check that out. But if I'm going to get a chance to go back in the theater see it again, personally, just me, I want to see it in all of its Let me, let me hard color. sell John for a second. Right. Just think about this. You go see it in the theater. Now, this is George Miller. He yeah. wants to do this. He wants to release it in the theaters in black and white. There has to be a reason. So imagine the transformative effect of seeing it in black and white. Yeah, you've already seen it in color. Now you're seeing a different almost a different version of it. Everything is going to feel different. That's that would be my it will, you know, it's true. It's a good point. I you you sold me. It, it's it's going to be a buy for me because I agree with you. The color was one of my favorite parts mm -hmm. of Mad Max Fury Road, but it black and white isn't just oh we're, we're just going to lose the color. It's a commentary on the action going on that George Miller wants you to experience in a different way. This is one of the directors that you trust when they want to show you something new or even something old. You believe this guy and what he's saying. So yes, if George Miller thinks I should see Mad Max Fury Road in black and white, he Here's my 15 bucks. Get me back in a theater. <laughs> All right, what's next? The first trailer for the upcoming sequel, Independence Day Resurgence, hit the web yesterday. Using recovered alien technology, the nations of Earth have collaborated on an immense defense program to protect the planet. But nothing can prepare us for the aliens' advance and unprecedented force. Only the ingenuity of a few brave men and women can bring our world back from the brink of extinction. Mark, do you buy or sell the first trailer for Independence Day Resurgence? Natasha, I'm going to buy it. I'm excited to get back up there and whoop E.T.'s ass again. I love watching this trailer. Was it silly? Was it ridiculous? Yeah. Have you seen the first Independence Day? It's the same thing. You're not touching some magical lore. This isn't Lord of the Rings where we're going back and fixing stuff. It's Independence Day. It's supposed to have this tone. I love watching this trailer. You know who I didn't miss? Will Smith. Didn't care about him at all because I love seeing Goldblum back. I love that they played uh, the president's speech from the first Independence Day in a different kind of tone. It was very Luke Skywalkery in the second Star Wars trailer. You see an older Bill Pullman. They're talking about what happened. They knew this day was going to come. And man, that ship is bigger than the last time we saw it. Yeah, I have been kind of, I've been looking forward to this movie. I think, especially the way they described it, I think there's a lot of potential there. Didn't know what I'd get out of the first trailer. I loved it. I, I, I love the first trailer and seeing Goldblum back and seeing, um, oh, who's the guy who plays the president? Dave, Bill Pullman. Bill Pullman. Uh, he looks no great, star. and he's got the he's got the cane there to try to make him look even older <laughs> than he is. I guess I thought it looked exactly the way. If you had asked me how should this trailer look after reading the synopsis, this is the trailer I would have painted. And I want to know, I want to know what unicorn blood is Judd Hirsch drinking, <laughs> because Judd Hirsch, who you see on that boat for a minute, right. looks younger yeah. than he did 20 years ago. How? How does he look? Unicorn that? blood. <laughs> Unicorn blood. I think him Unicorn and Steve blood. Martin have an apartment yeah. together where <laughs> all they do is hang out and not age. Like right. his son looks older than he does now. Like think, that yeah. is crazy. They found the unicorn and they're gently milking it every day. And they drink <laughs> unicorn milk. That's what, what I'm saying. Yeah, you you got to gently. You yeah, can't you, tug on it. Yeah, unicorn. keep it all. It's got to be happy. Yeah. It's a rainbow creature. <laughs> you have to keep it happy. Schnepp, you have not been looking forward to Independence Day 2, but you saw the trailer. Yeah. What are your thoughts on the trailer? Oh, boy. Oh, I sell this trailer oh. hard. <laughs> oh. Where did all this cheese come from? Is all I could say. It's like, 
<laughs> Man, uh, you know what? I saw Independence Day. It was called Independence Day. I don't need to see this movie again. <laughs> and this isn't like old home week. Like for me, it's seeing Star Wars, The Force Awakens, and seeing Han Solo, that meant something. I, seeing Judd Hirsch and Bill Pullman and Jeff Goldblum, it's like, I'm glad they got a paycheck. I don't care about the big shadow coming over. It's a, it just feels like bad old home week to me. Like, hey, let's do that thing again that happened again and again. It's like, you know, I didn't like it at all. And if they called it Independence for Independ ID Forever, I might have liked it a little bit more just because it would keep that extra cheese that I was hoping was like dripped all over it. But instead, it just feels like a lukewarm remake. Krampus has cold yeah, and hardened I think, your heart. I think the guy who wrote Krampus had something to do with this. You know, like he sprinkled some of his like horrible 80s crimp, crimping on it or something. I don't know. <laughs> All right, what's next? A little over three years ago, a stunning announcement came across the wire. Disney had bought Lucasfilm and was planning on developing new Star Wars movies. Tonight in Hollywood, the wait is over as the world premiere for Star Wars The Force Awakens takes place. John, you and Mark are actually attending the world premiere tonight. Now that the hype is over, the Marketing is done and the film is finally here. What are your feelings right now and what are you expecting for the next movie? Oh my God. I woke up, I, I don't know about you, but I woke up this morning and I was, I felt like I was nine again waking up on Christmas morning. Only instead of some like action figure under the tree, I get a new Star Wars movie that we never thought we were going to get. And it is so surreal. I still remember the day. I was by myself, everybody else had gone home. There was only like me and Dennis and Amy Rose was with us at the time. This is back in 2012. I was in our AMC office at the time and the news came out. It was about four o'clock in the afternoon. The news came out, Disney just bought Lucasfilm and they're planning on doing new Star Wars movies. That feels like it was last month. And now here we are, three years later, and Star Wars The Force Awakens premieres tonight. Now, a couple of things I should let you guys know about. We said that after we saw the premiere, we were gonna come right back here to the studio, film a review and put it up. Now, we are still gonna come right back here to the studio tonight and film a review, but at the time when we said we were gonna do that, Disney had not said there was any embargo on reviews. Now, traditionally, once there's the world premiere happens, there is no embargo on reviews. But this is a very special circumstance in the sense that there have been no press screenings because Star Wars uh, Lucasfilm is trying to keep this really under wraps. So there is a 24-hour review embargo. So Tuesday at midnight or Wednesday at 12.01 a.m., so tomorrow night at midnight, is when we'll actually put our non-spoiler, non-spoiler review of the movie up. But I also want to let you know that Mark, Christian, myself, Tiffany, we're all going down to the premiere night. Make sure you are following us on Instagram, okay? Follow us on Instagram. It's free to sign up for Instagram. Just make sure you're following us there because we're gonna be shooting like video clips and pictures of us right from before the car gets here to pick us up to take us down there in the car. When we get down there, show you what downtown Hollywood looks like right now. We'll shoot some little clips. Make sure you're following us on Instagram tonight. We'll also probably put them out on Twitter as well. So make sure you're following us at Collider Video on Twitter. Because we're gonna, we wanna share our experience with you tonight, uh, that whole thing. But as far as the pure like, feeling that we're gonna get to see Star Wars. Look, I'm a freaking loser. I make no pretense about it, I know. This, Star Wars is far more important to me than it should be as a franchise, but it's my earliest childhood memory. It's completely responsible for all my development as a kid. The creative part of my brain was all, always revolved around Star Wars, the whole kind of thing. I, I, I just don't have the words for it. Anyway, Mark, uh, after we're done here a little bit later, you're actually going down to rent your tux. Uh, yeah. For yeah. you're wearing a tux tonight. Yeah, I'm going big, John. <laughs> go big or go home because I've dreamed about this day forever. I can still remember when I had kind of made the decision when I was in college that, you know what, being a doctor just probably ain't in the cards. I want to be an entertainer. <laughs> and I remember watching red carpet coverage of the Phantom Menace premiere and thinking, you know what, that's a great goal. I want to be an entertainer. I want to be funny. I want people to acknowledge that. I want to be invited to a Star Wars premiere one day. Attack of the Clones came and went, and I was still in college. Revenge of the Sith came and went, and I just wasn't good enough. And then you was like, well, that's the end of Star Wars. That's, that's the end of the movies. We had a great run. We didn't think this could happen. And then three years ago, Christian and I had just finished shooting something at a studio. And I was driving home. He was driving to his place. And I, he calls me. And he says, we got to go to your place. We got to shoot right now. And I'm like, why? He's like, Disney bought Lucasfilm. Star Wars is coming back. And ever since that day, 
we had all this anticipation, all this speculation, and a lot of the reason why I get to go is through the graciousness of John Campia and Christian Harloff. Because of this show and Jedi Council, I guess I made somewhat of a mark enough to where people thought, <laughs> yeah, we should probably let Ellis tag along to the premiere. <laughs> And so the fact that I'm going tonight is something that, I, again, you never think it could happen. And there's been so much that's happened in my life since the last time I saw a Star Wars movie mm. for the first time. It's been 10 years. I've gone through a lot of stuff, a lot of good, a lot of bad. And the fact that I get to be here tonight is an honor that I will never forget. And it's going to be a feeling any unlike any other that I've ever had. I mean, this weekend it's been fun to take off the Star Wars pundit hat and just stop thinking about speculation, stop thinking about story, what's going to happen, who's going to die, who's going to live, and just be a fan and just go into this thing tonight and be a blank slate and absorb whatever the hell this movie wants to tell me. I'm going to soak it up. I'm going to try my best to not geek out too much. I'm going to try to not pee myself, but <laughs> no, no guarantees promises. because somehow I get to go to the premiere of Star Wars The Force Awakens. Schnepp, what does it feel like knowing that tonight, probably around 10, 15, I'm going to be texting you every spoiler about Star Wars. I told uh, Campia, yeah, like, just give me your parents' address so that I could send them your he severed head. <laughs> if you tell me anything about what Star Wars. No, I'm, I'm really excited for both these guys. They're like super Star Wars nerds. And, I, and I'm, I'm a big fan. I'm going to see it tomorrow with Dennis. But I'm really happy these guys are going to the red carpet. I think it's really fun. So I'll be living vicariously just like you guys, checking out some of the, they've basically closed off all of Hollywood Boulevard for like three blocks. For days, so, yeah, it's, so been it's been closed this, down. Like, so I don't know what's inside. Maybe there's a giant Jar Jar. I don't know what's inside. <laughs> it's probably not Jar Jar. But it's, there's gonna be some cool stuff inside of this weird magic Star Wars Disney tent. And these guys are gonna be in there. So definitely check it out. I'll be watching it with no spoilers. These guys aren't gonna spoil anything because we know where they live and I'll let you know where they live if they do <laughs> spoiling so <laughs> and, and, and in the age it. of social media when you can go online on twitter and facebook whatever and just see all the hate slinging around right. and jealousy every time i posted something about how i'm going to this premiere the response has been a hundred percent positive yeah. from all the collider fans out there i can't thank you guys enough because i feel almost like we're elected representatives yeah. to, to to say hey the entire star wars community is coming here and here's who we chose to go see it first i feel like rocky running through the streets of philadelphia with a bunch of kids <laughs> around me like go mark yeah. go mark Star Wars, and uh, I'm gonna watch this movie not just for me, for my family, my friends, all you guys out there. Which is really the main reason why, when we mentioned the Instagram stuff and following us on Twitter tonight, all that kind of stuff, is because while we can't take you into the movie with us, we want to share as much of this experience with you guys as possible. Because we wouldn't be going if it wasn't for you guys, which is just awesome. It's Star Wars Day. It's Star Wars Day. It's Star Wars Day. All right. <laughs> Uh, it's time now for that part of the show called Mailbag. Listen, if you've got a topic or a question you'd like us to address on the show, just email us anytime at collidervideo at gmail.com. Now, for those of you watching us live, we're going to save a few minutes at the end of the show to take some of your live questions. How can you get one of your live questions on? Simple. Make sure you're following us on Twitter at Collider Video and tweet on in some questions. Natasha is going to be our gatekeeper today. She'll pick out which questions get on later. But for now, let's get to our mailbag. So, Natasha, what's in the mailbag today? Derek F. Walker Jr. writes, Is it time for the world to realize that the Hemsworth brothers are not leading <laughs> actors? Their box office numbers prove it. Everything Chris does is a bomb unless he's playing Thor. And to be honest, his brother just can't act. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, first up, Okay, well, yeah, let's talk Liam Hemsworth. I, I've gone on this before. I, I have met with and spoken with Liam Hemsworth a number of times. Super nice guy, actually. Like, way more down-to-earth than you think he would be. For guys considered a, a new generation sex symbol, has, you know, a famous family line. He's in all these big, huge Hunger Game movies. Now he's going to be in Independence Day, whatever. He can't act. He, he just can't act. I mean, he's a super nice guy. Uh, I hope nothing but great things for him. And who knows? Like, hey, acting is also a skill. It's an art. You can learn and get better. And who knows where he'll be in five, six, seven years. Maybe he'll be an amazing actor in five, six, seven years. But right now, I just got to be honest, you're right. His Liam cannot act right now. Chris, however, is a totally different situation. Um, all the movies, he's, he's basically led three movies outside of Thor movies. Um, he did uh, Black Hat, mm -hmm. which was 
terrible, just terrible film. He did Rush, which was a profitable movie. That movie actually made money, which is remarkable when you consider that nobody in North America cares about Formula One racing. <laughs> and yet they still managed to make money. They made over 90 million bucks on, on a film that was around 30-ish million dollars to produce did well and a lot of people thought that Chris maybe could have gotten a, a, an acting nomination for that because he was fantastic in that movie and then of course he had in the heart of the sea um you're forgetting the huntsman oh and of course the huntsman which made hit, money and they're making a sequel yeah which which they're making another one and made <clears throat> money uh and with the problems that I had with the huntsman Chris Hemsworth is never one of those problems had more to do with Snow White than anything else but um so here's the thing though when you look at movies like Black Hat or in the heart of the sea the question isn't, well, that movie had him in it and it failed to make money. Yeah, but I guarantee you this. You had, Black Hat was a bad idea from the beginning. You have almost anybody else star in that movie, it makes less money than it did. And it bombed. But you put in, uh, maybe maybe there's one or two other guys you could put in there, might have made a little bit more. But that movie was never going to make much money considering how bad it was. And no matter how good of an actor you are, you're not going to take a bad movie. An actor cannot take a bad movie and make it good no matter how good their performance is. So I believe there's enough evidence there to show, number one, Chris is actually a very talented actor. Uh, number two, he can be a box office draw. The ones that have been failures so far really had nothing to do with the fact that it was Chris Hemsworth. But I completely agree with you about Liam um, right now. But who knows? Let's see what happens with Liam in the coming years. Maybe he takes that next step. Anyway, Mark, how do you see the Hemsworth? As a right new now? generation sex symbol myself, uh, <laughs> I think Liam and Chris, I think they both have a lot of potential as far as being on screen presences. I think they can both be fantastic actors somewhere down the road. I think Chris is that right now. I do not think he's an A lister at the box office. When you look at the movies he's done outside of the Avengers, you can even include that stuff because he's great in the movies. And and he is one of the stars of the film, but he's not what they're leading their marketing campaigns with. I didn't get that, even though he's on the posters for Rush and he's on a lot of In the Heart of the Sea, I feel like Rush was led by It's a Racing Movie and In the Heart of the Sea is led by It's a Whale Movie about Moby Dick. Black Hat, is, I didn't hate Black Hat like everybody else did, but it came out in January, which is known as a dumping ground. That movie was destined to fail pretty much from the start. But when you see Thor, you don't get the feeling that this is somebody like like a Sam Worthington, perhaps, or as Christian would say, a, a Jai Courtney, right. that it's, it's a star that we don't want that's being shoved down our throats. And those guys are fine actors, too. But I, I never get the feeling that, that we're being forced Chris Hemsworth. Because every time I see him on screen, I like seeing him. And to be honest with Liam, I just don't have enough of a sample size outside of the Hunger Games, which I think he's fine in. I don't think he holds down the Hunger Games movies, the ones that he's done by himself. I haven't enjoyed that much, but I need a bigger sample size from both these guys outside of their huge franchise. Did you see him in that movie he did with Harrison Ford and Gary Oldman? I did. Uh, where he played that? Oh. Yeah. Wow. Maybe I should watch it again. Yeah, what Maybe made that especially myself. bad was that he was acting against Gary Oldman and Harrison right, Ford. Right. Well, that puts you like one step behind. Anyway, your thought on the Hemsworth brothers? Yeah, you know what? I mean, like you said, uh, Liam, I don't think he's done enough, at least for me to see. Like I saw him in Hunger Games. I saw him. He was in uh, one of the Expendables movies. Got killed really quick. Was remember it was the Bowman? It was like a guy with an like, archer. Yeah, but you know, it was a five-second scene. Whatever. When, when you run into Van Damme. Yeah, Chuck <laughs> Norris was the star of the Expendables too. Let's let's make no mistake about that. I don't care who else was in it. Um, hey, I'm hey, just here to sell ab equipment. That's right. See you guys later. Make sure I'm in solo scenes. I don't want to be with the rest of them. I got to be killing people by myself. That's not even what he sounds like. That's a horrible Chuck Norris. This is my Chuck Norris. Um, Hemsworth, I think he's great. Chris Hemsworth, he's a lot of fun. He's one of the, the parts of, of the horrible vacation movie that I saw. Right, that I thought right. sucked. Um, I'm in a negative mood today. All these movies suck. No, they don't. I'm just talking about specific ones that suck, like <laughs> Vacation, um, the new one. But he was great in it. So he, I, was, he, he was. He was really he was, gold in he, that. Yeah, and I think Chris Hemsworth's next big hit will be a comedy. He should break out of the superhero action mold and, and do a leading man comedy role. I think that would that really fits him. He's funny. He's got a natural sense of humor. So I, I would hope that he he's gonna do like maybe some kind of romantic comedy or just a straight up buddy cop weirdo fun action adventure comedy like Twenty One Jump Street. I think he could he could roll right into a yeah. Natural take a little bit of a Channing Tatum. Channing path. Tatum, yeah. like hang that. It's a great right call because he was also really good in Cabin in the Woods too. So I mean, but both literally oh, and right. figuratively, totally. he's got a lot of muscles to flex when it comes to being on screen. We yep. just haven't gotten to see enough of it yet. Yeah. So I don't hey. think yet. Yeah, it's no mistake. And I think the Huntsman, the sequel. I think you know a lot of people say, well, it's just like Thor. He's throwing an axe instead of a hammer. He's replaceable. He's got a, a lot of charisma. And I think going comedy is good for him. So if you haven't seen his stint on <laughs> Saturday Night Live. 
watch his stint on Saturday Night Live because he was <laughs> bloody hilarious on that. And I, I mean, genetically, it's almost unfair. Yeah. I mean, these, these guys are, should not be talented. Yeah. They, no, know, no, <laughs> like them having any talent is like just universally unfair because that's yeah. a that's a good looking like your your boyfriend is one of these guys. I, I mean, and they bring in you my home mind, and, yes. you meet, <laughs> and you meet their brother who is like equally or ju- or even better looking. I mean, that's just not no. fair. You imagine just being the Hemsworth's dad and just sitting on your porch watching them all do you know their Australian yard work, just like I I did that. Yeah, <laughs> right here. Have you ever yeah. seen the third Hemsworth brother? No, is he good looking? No, but oh um, poor but guy, hey, genetic. <laughs> I, look here, no, here's another. Is he a good looking guy? Sure. I mean, but I mean, not compared to these two. But he is like actually a very successful television actor in Australia right now. And a lot of people say he might actually be the most talented of the bunch. He just didn't get. Like he's like got the Danny DeVito side of the genetics <laughs> compared to their Arnold Schwarzenegger side. I mean, right. I'm being overly critical. That's I, I'm sounding more critical. I mean, well, he's no, not no. an not he's not an unattractive. No, but guy. you know, like like you 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 were on stage with all those guys. Like when we did that press junket with the Avengers, it was me and a bunch of other like nerd reporters. Like, yeah, we're gonna talk to Captain America, or whatever. Like Thor shows up, we're like, he really is a god. <laughs> yeah, he really is. He's like better looking in person. We're like, I want to kill you, dude, because you're like unnaturally genetically kind of perfect. You're playing the right role. You're the god of thunder. All right, you get. When it. I was hosting the Avengers: Age of Ultron uh, press conference, I was in there and I had a couple of female reporters behind me, and then and I knew them when I was talking to them. And Chris Evans and uh, uh, Robert Downey Jr. are standing there, and they're just talking about, "Wow, these guys are so good looking." Blah blah. blah. I'm like, All right. And then Chris Hemsworth came in to talk to them, and, and he's just standing there. And then then one of them says. All of a sudden, Chris Evans and Robert Downey Jr. aren't that good looking. <laughs> <laughs> it's like it was like yeah, this right. weird conversation. All right, what's next? All right, Charles Watson writes, "Hello, my fellow Star Wars fans. I have a question about the Star Wars premiere. I know that you will all be very, the very lucky ones to see it tonight, and you're planning on doing a review of it afterwards. I know you all will shoot the spoilers and post that on Wednesday, but how will you be able to do your views?" tonight if you are unable to give away any plot points. Keep up the amazing work and may the force be with you. Well, yeah, it's funny because a lot of people have been asking me ever since I said we're going to be doing a non-spoilers review first and then probably on Friday we're going to release a full-fledged 45 minute to an hour and a half long full-fledged spoilers review, so keep your eye open for that. We're not going to put that out until everybody's had a chance to see the movie uh, first, though. But people are saying, it's like, how can you possibly do a non-spoilers review? Like, not give away your reactions. Well, it's called any movie review ever. I mean, you all, all movie reviews hopefully are basically spoiler free. You don't give away the major plot points. You know, when we do our review, we're going to talk. We're going to basically say, you know, our reactions to the film, how much, what parts of it we liked, uh, elements that we didn't like without giving away plot points. We'll talk about whether we liked the performance or not. Did the movie surprise us? Did it not? You know, and this how we felt. Even, but the same thing you do for any movie review ever done. We're not going to give any spoilers away in this first one at all. But you will walk away knowing if we like the film or not. But that's what every movie review is. So you can't really consider that a spoiler. Mark, how do you see that? I'm going to talk about another great film, Encino Man. So when you <laughs> are talking about Encino Man, you know going into that movie that it's Pauly Shore and Sean Astin, and they find a caveman buried in Encino, California. He comes back to life. He goes to high school. He tries to fit in, and some shenanigans go down. If that was a Star Wars movie, you would not know any of that stuff from the trailers so in my review i couldn't talk about oh yeah then they find the caveman there's very very limited stuff you can say however in a review you can talk about if you like the movie or not what you liked about the movie what you didn't like without being specific that's the key here is that like look i don't i haven't seen the movie yet so i don't know if han solo eats it i don't know if we even see luke skywalker in this movie I have a feeling we will. I have my guesses one way or another, but when we're giving you the non-spoiler review, we're not gonna tell you any of that stuff. We're gonna go in with the information that you're aware of, talk about that, and then say whether we think you should go see the movie or not. And it's probably gonna be a yes. Well, you know, never before, like, I've never experienced this kind of like, I've been talking to people who are like, I don't even wanna know if you like it or you don't like it. Like, people don't wanna know, because they wanna go right. into this movie as blank as possible, but let me remind every single one of you who has seen even one of the trailers, you've seen some of something that's in Star Wars. So I, I don't I don't feel like it's necessary. Like I've seen all of the trailers and I've enjoyed all of them and they were amazingly well cut where I feel like it's not spoiled for me. I just got a taste of, of some of the planets they're gonna be on. They're on an ice planet. Oh, it's a spoiler. Come on, I mean, if you saw the trailer, you know they're on an ice planet. 
I don't know what it's called. I don't know what's going to happen on the ice planet, but there's a planet it's called ice. Freezy. Yeah, it's called Freezy. They're also on a place. Uh, the they, Freezy The Millennium system. Falcon goes to a place called Castle. You know, I don't know what that is. So <laughs> it's Schnappy, a white totally castle. spoiled the Millennium Falcon. Falcon I got to be in the movie. I can't stop talking about scenes that have been all around the world playing on uh, on trailers. But all I can say is like. I'll see it tomorrow. I'm going to see it a day after them. I told I'll tell these guys go ahead and leave messages and spoil it on my phone, and then I'll listen to it after I see the movie. I'm cool yeah, with that. Yeah, because about half of us get to see it tonight, but yeah. then the other half of everybody here is going to go see yeah. it tomorrow at the press. And screening. we're going to yeah. all be completely respectful. Like I'm going to see it tomorrow, and I'm not going to talk about it. It's going to be hard to not talk about. It. I'll talk about it with these guys. I'll talk about it with people who saw the movie. But I'm going to be incredibly, especially. Uh, respectful to anyone who's on the internet because like if you're on Facebook and you're just scrolling f scrolling along it's a real jerk move to put a spoiler like that's happened to me with Walking Dead like mm -hmm. people just like did you know this happened it's like don't be jerks appreciate and respect all your other nerd friends and like this is a cool movie it's a special movie and especially like the way that Dis Disney has been extra specially protective of it not because I don't think it's because we're talking like normally you'd be like, oh, why are they being so protective? It's because it's a bad movie. It's like they're trying to preserve the fun, the fun that like all of us experienced when we were kids, when we saw Star Wars for the first time. It's like an incredible adventure. And it's so rare to get that. Most of the time, movies are completely spoiled. You know, the beginning, the middle and the end but before you even see it. And that's and they do that with trailers. And I'm I'm really happy they haven't done that with this movie. So I would ask everyone just be cool for the next couple of days. If you don't want to know about the Star Wars movie, I know a lot of people putting up screens like, you know, not I'm offline till December 18th. Remember, they're going to do a spo like a non spoiler review that'll pop up tomorrow night. We're all going to do a spoilers review. So even some people didn't even get their tickets until like Saturday. They're like, they're not seeing it on the 18th or the 19th. They're seeing it on the 20th or the 21st. So like if if you're in that group where you're seeing it this coming weekend, you got to know that the rest of the planet is going to be talking about this movie. So if you're on the Internet, stay off of it is all I can say, because yeah. there's going to be people. There's going to be all those trolls ruining it for you. So if you really do care about that, just do yourself a favor and just stay off the Internet. Read a book. Go to a comic book store with <laughs> earmuffs on. Buy some really <laughs> cool comics. Do yourself a favor, enjoy it, get a candle, turn off all electricity, <laughs> get all caveman style for like three days, and then go see Star Wars, and you'll enjoy it. Now, I, we're going to share online, I loved it, or yeah. I really liked it, not quite as good as I was hoping, but I really liked it, or I'm disappointed, or whatever, but you're not going to hear us say, turns out that Kylo Ren is, yeah, you're not going to hear us say it. Well, you'll hear us say that in the spoiler review, that that comes on Friday. And that's great that we have the luxury of doing the spoilers review, too, because it means that we can handle everything else in the original review with, with kid gloves as far as, like, I'm not sure if this is a spoiler, so I better not say anything, because we can save it for the spoilers review that everybody's going to enjoy once you see the movie. Mm -hmm. All right, last mailbag question, and then we will get to your live Twitter questions. Last one, Dale Harrison writes, hi, guys, big fan from England. My question is, who do you think will be the best comic book movie hero and villain performances from 2016 if you had to choose now? My picks are Ryan Reynolds' Deadpool, although he's more of an anti-hero, and the Batfleck, I couldn't decide. Mm -hmm. With my villain being Jared Leto's Joker, who I believe is going to smash it. High hopes for Oscar Isaac's Apocalypse 2. Keep doing what you're doing. Um, I th as far as the heroes go, it's hard to go against your two picks. Ryan Reynolds was born to play Deadpool, I think. So I, there's that. And I have always thought from day one, Schnepp, since that first day they announced that we did that video, I believe Ben Affleck is going to crush it as Batman as well. So those are my two picks. As far as the villains go, I think there's a very intriguing villains. And I got to tell you too, I think while I am dying to see Jared Leto's Joker, I am. I think there is a chance he might get upstaged by Chiwetel Ejiofor and Doctor Strange. Mm -hmm. Ooh. Uh, I mean, so, I mean, him playing uh, Mordo in that is, that is so bloody intriguing. So to me, that's the villain I kind of, obviously Jared Leto as well, but the one that I don't hear a lot of people talking about, one of the best actors breathing today is Chiwetel Ejiofor, and him being in Doctor Strange, I got my eye on that. They might, they might even use him as a villain in this movie. Eventually, you know he's going to be. Right. He might be in this movie, so it's hard to say for sure, but that's what I'm watching. What about you? Who's who's the heroes? To, who's yeah. going to give the best hero performances and the best villain performances? Well, I'm definitely with you. With uh, I'm looking forward, especially after seeing Ben do those roles, as the lines as Bruce Wayne. 
I, I like his interpretation of Batman and Bruce Wayne. So I'm looking forward to that. I'm specifically, I'm glad you brought up Doctor Strange. I'm looking forward to Benedict Cumberbatch as Doctor Strange as one of my favorite comic book characters. I've been waiting for them to do Doctor Strange and do it right. And it feels like they're killing it with the cast. It's an insane cast. You tell Edgy for Mads Mikkelsen, Tilda Swinton. I mean, it's like, are you kidding me? This is a superhero film. These are amazing actors and actresses. So I'm looking forward to Benedict Cumberbatch. I'm definitely looking forward to, to the Joker, but I feel like, I mean, I know a lot of people had issues with the Apocalypse trailer. I liked the, the X-Men Apocalypse trailer, and I specifically, just from the line readings that I've heard, Oscar Isaac's performance feels like it has that gravitas that that character Apocalypse needs. Will it outshine the Joker? I don't know, so I'm still riding with the Joker as the best villain, but Apocalypse second. Yeah, as far as villains go, it's gotta be Bebop and Rocksteady from the new Ninja Turtles <laughs> movie. Uh, yeah, I'd definitely throw the Joker in there too, and uh, you know, Suicide Squad coming out, it, it, there, there's a lot of bad guys in that movie. Now, will they end up doing some heroic things? I don't know, but if I can still count them as villains, I'd say all of them. And as far as heroes go, wild card here is Gambit. That's another pick. Yeah, but that's I, not a bad one, too. I, I, Channing Tatum could really do something special with that. Cumberbatch, obviously. Ryan Reynolds is Deadpool. And Ben Affleck as Batman is the one that, if everybody wasn't already saying it, that'd be the one. Because as soon as he was cast, I was like, that's, that's a really cool choice for Bruce Wayne. Because mm -hmm. we get to see older, different, out-of-retirement Batman. Cannot wait to see that. All right, folks, where I said we take a little bit of time to take some of your live Twitter questions, and we're going to do that right now. Once again, make sure you're following us on Twitter at Collider Video. Send them on in. So, Natasha, what have you picked out? All right, Mark Burdett writes, Collider Video, who is at the top of your list you hope to meet at the Force Awakens premiere tonight? Ooh, that's a good question. I know we even get a chance to meet people. Yeah, well, normally you do. So we're going to get dialed up and see a movie. I get to talk to the stars of it, too? <laughs> no, Holy what is, crap. What is really cool about these premieres, and I'm, I'm very lucky I get to go to a lot of these premieres, and what's really cool is that you come out and you're in the foyer of the theater, and it's just like any other movie theater, except standing here is Kevin Feige, standing over here is Chris Hemsworth, standing over here is whatever. And I've had a, a lot of chances, actually, to run into a lot of these guys and talk to them at the theater and things like that. Um, this is going to be big tonight, though. I mean, this is going to be thousands. Like, normally, like, a Disney World premiere, like, I was just at the world premiere for The Good Dinosaur, right? And it's in a 700 theat theater. theater. There's going to be, like, three to 4,000 people going to the Star Wars premiere tonight. So it's a little bit of a different animal. But I would go off the top of my head. One, Steven Spielberg, because I know he's going to be there tonight. Uh, two, George Lucas. Three, Harrison Ford. Four, John Boyega. Five... Uh, Daisy Ridley, six JJ, um, and I'll go seven Mark Hamill, and then anybody else as well. But if I had to say, okay, you can just take a handful that you would absolutely run into, those would be the ones I would absolutely want to run into. What about you, Mark? It'd be nice to say hi to my good friend C3PO and R2D2 again. Yeah. <laughs> um, Mark Hamill is right at the top of the list, as is George Lucas. I have random stupid luck with peeing next to famous people. Like at these <laughs> events, like I'll just have to go to the bathroom and I walk in there and you look over and it's like, oh my God, I'm, I'm, I'm taking a lead next to Bruce Willis. Holy crap. That's going to happen tonight. I guarantee you I pee next to somebody famous tonight, and I will Instagram that. No, I won't, but it's, it's going to be somebody. I true, bet it's JJ. Absolute true story. World premiere of Guardians of the Galaxy. It was at the... It was at the Dolby Cinema. It was at the Dolby Theater, and I went into the bathroom, and I'm at one of the Unreal Stars, and I kid you not, on my left was Lee Pace, who uh, played uh, 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 the, uh, Ronan the Accuser. The accuser. Mm -hmm. Who played Ronan the Accuser, and on my right was I cannot remember the actor's name. The guy who was the head of the uh, of the uh, Nova Corps, the guy who was the head pilot, the one that says, "What what a bunch of a holes." That guy. Oh, the head uh, of Peter the Serafinovitz. Is that really his name? Yeah, I'm, I'm impressed that you pulled that out. He also so, played. He was the voice of Darth Maul. Just little Star Wars facts for you kids. Wow. Did not know that. Yeah. So, yeah, I had those two guys just talking about the movie, and I'm just in the middle thing. This is really weird. We all got our, <laughs> all got our dicks out, just being, being, and just talking like guys. That was pretty cool. If you were there tonight, would what would and you had to say like three guys you really wish you could bump into, who would be those three? It'd be Mark Hamill. I'd be like, how come you didn't invite me to the premiere? I thought we were friends. <laughs> I've worked with him before. Just kidding, Mark. Um, it would. I would love to. Uh, I would like you named it. Uh, Spielberg would be great to uh, run into. I don't know. Like, I mean, sometimes it's weird. Like, I would. I would just be like, Hey, man, can I get a picture? And to get a picture, because it's like, or be like, Dude, I love all your movies. I don't know. And so sometimes you like, like I don't really freak out when I meet like you know famous people anymore. But sometimes if you like, there's a few that I would. 
like uh, you know, it would be Spielberg. It would be like, oh my god, I would like, lose my mind. Yeah, so if I, got I would to probably Spielberg. like just like, hey, can you quickly take a picture awkwardly? And I'd be like looking all strange. It would be a photo I wouldn't put on Instagram because I'd look stupid. <laughs> that happened to me the first time I took a, a photo with Stan Lee. I looked all dumb, and luckily my girlfriend Holly. <laughs> was like, hey, go go back up there and let's get a good picture of you. So I got a good picture. My fiance, Holly. Aww. Aww. Um, so, you know, that's a, it, sometimes it's weird when you meet people that you idolize or looked up to or have like known since you were a little kid. And that's what most of these people in the Star Wars universe are. We have known them since we were a little kid. So it's a little weird. So. All right. What do you got next? Darth Daddy writes, could <laughs> Force Awakens possibly touch an Oscar, Oscar or be nominated for anything? Well, I, I mean, any movie coming out has the potential to get Oscar nominations. We haven't seen the movie. So, I mean, is it possible? Yes, because it's a movie that meets all the requirements of the Academy. Uh, but uh, as far as its real chances, we can't even speculate until we have a chance to see the movie. I can. It's winning Best Picture. What are you talking about? <laughs> it's winning Best Picture of 2015. And Leo is just going to outgun John Boyega for Best Actor. <laughs> what do you think, Schnepp? I'll have to see it. I mean, anything's possible. We don't know. I mean, I think we already know a lot of effects awards yeah, and effects like awards, sound design stuff yeah, like that. That's stuff that's probably in the pocket, you know? Yeah. Like, it's really hard to tell, though. But could this be such an amazingly fun, incredible adventure, like on the tip of like Lord of the Last Lord of the Rings, Return of the King, which did sweep the Oscars? Yeah. And it was a science fiction fantasy. So anything is possible. That's all I can say. All right, what's next? Okay, Senor Pizza writes, what's the best? I'm just picking the ones with the fun names today. <laughs> what's the best movie franchise other than Star Wars? You know, there was a, we had a great debate uh, maybe about a year ago about best movie trilogies, mm. you know? So obviously you got to talk. I mean, some people don't like the third one. That's fine, but you got to put The Godfather in that conversation. Uh, you got to talk about Lord of the Rings. You can mention Christopher Nolan's Batman mm -hmm. franchise. Obviously there's Star Wars. To me, this is one, whenever I mention it, people go, oh, yeah, the Toy Story uh, franchise. Yeah. I mean, in Rotten Tomatoes terms, 100%, 100%, 99%. That is literally their Rotten Tomatoes ratings. 100%, 100%, and 99%. That's the worst one, is 99%. Um, as Other than Star Wars, I actually rank, and then, of course, you got to talk about the original Indiana Jones trilogy. Mm -hmm. has got to be way up there. I would personally go Star Wars... The original Lord of the Rings, I'll go Toy Story, then Indiana Jones, then the Christopher Nolan Batman franchise. Nope, screw that. I'm going to put Godfather a trilogy, then Christopher Nolan in number six. So that's how I would do What about you? In addition to the ones that you mentioned, I mean, I think I probably have number one and number two are Star Wars and Indiana Jones, but some other ones I'll just throw in the pile are the Lethal Weapon franchise mm -hmm. and the Bourne franchise. Because regardless of what you thought about the Jeremy Renner movie, I don't think there's a bad flick in that bunch. All yeah. the Lethal Weapon movies are great. And there's been four of them, so it's got to count. Now here's something that's weird. I was just talking about this yesterday. Even though I haven't seen Creed yet, the Rocky film came out the same year that Star Wars came out. Rocky and Star Wars came out in wow. 1977, and this year, their seventh episodes of both of the franchises came out this year, Creed and Star Wars The Force Awakens. So I'd put Rocky right up in there in like this amazing story arc that just keeps going. Um, I don't know if I would add Fast and the Furious. I know there's gonna be like 15 of those, but I might chuck <laughs> in Chronicles of Riddick, yo. Oh. Uh, ah. I know everyone else doesn't like it, but like for the top though, I would definitely, yes, yeah, Star Wars is definitely my top trilogy. The Alien Quadrilogy, just kidding, guys. Um, oh, then boy. there comes uh, Oh, boy. I would probably, like for myself, Raiders of the Lost Ark, one, two, and three. Um, I don't count the fourth one. That says we're talking about the trilogy. The original trilogy. Yeah, yeah yes. the original trilogy, and then the weird, strange one that they're trying well, to erase. Well, I can still throw Die Hard in there, too, because can, the first three Die Hards are great. Yeah, I mean, but th there's also movie like, a whole bunch of, like, Alien. You know, there's, like, Alien 1 and 2 are great. Are fantastic. 3 yeah. and 4, not yeah. so much, and the Alien Predator. But I like Prometheus better than I liked Alien 3 and 4. So it's so weird when you start to get these hybrid. It's not really a trilogy, but it's a continuation. But it's part of this strange, weird franchise world. So Also, Back to the Future is, like, the first movie is so great right. that the other two is just fun being back in that world for a Same little bit. Same thing with The Matrix. First movie, incredible. Mm -hmm. Second two, let's not talk about them. So <laughs> I rebought just the first one. I'm like, that's the only one that exists and I got that in Blu-ray son so well, let me put uh, Natasha on the spot Natasha what is your favorite film franchise 
Well, I mean, we've talked about this so many times. My favorite film franchise is definitely hands down Lord of the Rings. I, right, I nerd that. out every time. I actually cried when I <laughs> heard that The Hobbit was coming out again because, like you guys, you know, I was you know growing up in elementary school waiting for this new Hobbit film to come out. When it finally came out, I called my best friend who. I'm we, sorry. Wait, you were in elementary school when the first Hobbit came out? No, 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 no. I'm saying <laughs> when say, the Return of the King. Yeah. <laughs> when the Return of the King came out, I was I think I was like seventh or eighth grade. So Something like that. So middle school. Um, and I call my best friend who we both had a crush on Orlando Bloom as Legolas because I think he looks way better in a blonde wig than with normal hair. <laughs> but I called her and we're like, oh my God, oh my God. I think we waited like six years then after and we both went to the midnight premiere of The Hobbit. Even though I don't like The Hobbits, it was just that experience. So I mean, that's like one of those sentimental movies. It's just, it's my favorite. Well, Can't we can be beat. on a day like today, we can appreciate the sentimental yes. attachments. <laughs> All right, last Twitter question of the day. Okay, Joe Gould, I hope I pronounced that right, says 60 Minutes called J.J. Abrams the Spielberg of this generation. Do you agree? I think it may be a bit of a stretch. It's a stretch. Mm -hmm. It's a stretch. Um, I have a lot of respect for J.J., especially a lot of his television stuff that he's done. Yeah. Like Alias, I, I mean, Alias is just the shit. I love Alias. Fringe. Fringe was great. A, a lot of. Um, Lost. Yeah, Lost, obviously. So he's done a lot of great stuff on TV. I really appreciate what he has done with the Star Trek franchise up to now. Super 8, not so much, but whatever. Um, so, I, so I think he is a solid, good director that I'm excited mm -hmm. that, you know, J.J. wouldn't have been my first pick to direct the new Star Wars films, but he was one of those names. There's probably a list of six or seven names I'd go, hey, but I'll be excited if any of these people do it. Right. And J.J. was definitely one of those names. Calling him the new Spielberg, let's get four or five best director nominations on his resume before we start having that conversation. So I, I think it's just getting ahead of ourselves a little bit to call him that yet. Yeah, I, I might change my tune after tonight, but but for now, let's let's let. Are you seeing the movie tonight? Oh. So am I. It's exciting. <laughs> I don't think you can call him the next Spielberg yet because what J.J. Abrams has done primarily is I know The Rock likes to call himself this, but J.J. has been franchised by Agra too. Not only with Star Trek, but now hopefully with Star Wars, where Steven Spielberg started franchises. Man, I mean, he started Indiana Jones and the Jaws movies and all these incredible things that we love and celebrate to this day. So I need to see a little bit more original ideas from J.J. Abrams, which I really like mm -hmm. Super 8. I thought Lost was terrific. I want to see more of that kind of stuff as well as some kick-ass outer space movies. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I think J.J. Abrams it has the potential to, in like 10 or 15 years, be a Spielberg-esque. You know what I mean? Like, uh, obviously, he's a big fan of Spielberg. They produce Super 8 together, but Spielberg is on his own continent. You know what I mean? Like let alone Jaws, let alone E.T. I mean, the, the list of his films that span all genres that are all incredible films, like, I don't think there was a miss, except maybe you might want to count 1941 as like a hey, or it may be always. There's a couple in that 30 or 40 films that he's directed where you're like, not this one or that one, but all the other 35. That's really impossible to put anyone in that same category. He's in a category of his own, just like Scorsese. There's like names that are specific to filmmaking, JJ's becoming that name. I think he isn't that name yet, but he's put in, if you look at the sheer hours of that he's put in logging on television, hundreds and hundreds of episodes, you know? He, he got his, his early start, he, he actually was one of the screenwriters for Superman before Man of Steel, he wrote Superman Flyby, which I liked the script, it was different, it, it was revisionist, it changed up everything, but yet it still maintained that specialness that is Superman, so that's why I like that he, he's, they, they tap him for, hey, let's revisit Star Trek, but change it a little bit. Let's revisit Star Wars and change it a little bit, but keep everything that's core. So, you know, I think in the future, Perhaps, but not now. Yeah, it's it's kind of funny. The media seems very anxious to anoint the next Spielberg. Right. Do you remember the last guy that the big media push was to anoint as the next Spielberg? No. Shamhammer, M. Night. Remember oh, the, the big right. the big cover right. of Time magazine, the next Steven right. Spielberg. Look at that one. Look, you're, you're right. There is no other Steven Spielberg. When you look at the sheer volume of all time classics that this guy's done. I would say if, if there was anybody right now truly positioned to someday maybe inherit the crown, it might be Christopher Nolan. But even he, we got to we got to see where he is five, six, seven, eight years from now than right now. But I think if anybody has that potential right now, it's probably Nolan. Michael Bay just threw a Bud Light can at the screen. <laughs> <laughs> All right, folks, that'll do it for us. The last time you're going to see a, a lot of these shining faces, 
Before they've seen Star Trek The Force Awakens. Star Wars. Star Wars The Force Awakens. Did I say Star Trek The Force Awakens? Star Trek. You know why? no longer Chef Ticket Ticket. Star Trek The Force Awakens. Star Trek The Force Awakens. Turn in your ticket and your nerd card. Somebody make that poster. Somebody make that Star Trek. Mickey Mouse comes walking in. Give him back. Cobblepot, where have you been? The weird, strange Mickey Mouse. I'm taking your ticket, Campia. He grabs it with his feet and floats away with spider wings. Somebody make that poster for us. Star, Star Trek The Force Awakens. Please make that poster for us. Oh, boy. Uh, thank you so much for listening. Don't forget, lots of great films. Kind of like a little film called Star Wars. It's <gasps> coming to our friends at AMC Theaters. Make sure you head on over to www.amctheaters.com for all of your theater, showtime, and, of course, movie ticket information. And don't forget that uh, there's a Chipmunks and uh, Sisters movie coming out as well. Those would be footnotes yeah. in history. I want to thank the people sitting at the table with me. First of all, starting on my left, Mr. John Schnepp. Schnepp, where can people find you online? You guys can follow me on Twitter and Instagram, just at John Schnepp. I'm seeing Star Wars Resurgence today with Roland Emmerich <laughs> and Michael Doherty. we got a special screening. That's not happening. Um, you guys can find my film. It's a documentary, The Death of Superman Lives, What Happened. And uh, you can find it just at www.tdoslwh.com. Uh, buy a digital download, support independent film, and then support Star Wars The Force Awakens when you see it, whenever you're going to see it. Sitting over here, my own Mr. Spock, Mr. Mark Ellis. Mark, where can people find you online? You can, in about 15 minutes, you can find me at the Burbank Men's Warehouse. See you there. <laughs> get, get those sizes ready. On Twitter and Instagram, at 5150 Ellis. And provided I don't turn into a puddle of fanboy goo tonight, I'll be at the Tempe Improv this weekend, the 17th through the 20th. Let's talk Star Wars and have some yucks. And, of course, our lovely host today, Miss Natasha Martinez. Natasha, where can people find you online? You guys can all find me on Instagram at Natasha A. Martinez and on Twitter at Natasha Lexis underscore and uh, make sure you guys are following me on Facebook and on Twitter at John Campia I will often do like announcements and everything regarding uh, Collider movies and uh, Collider video here on my social media channels first and don't forget to also be following us at Collider video so that'll do it for us guys thanks so much for joining us and until tomorrow when I will have seen Star Wars The Force Awakens <laughs> bye bye <laughs> Hey guys, if you like this video, click the thumbs up button. Also, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. It'll help you stay up to date with everything we've got going on here at Collider.